I'm Renee Richard, and we are here in New Orleans again at Cabrini High School. And that name alone should tell you a little bit about who we're going to be talking about, and that is St. Francis Xavier Cabrini and the work that she did here in New Orleans. What plenty of our viewers may not realize is that um, the high school here is actually a portion of the orphanage that she founded here and where she lived, prayed, um, and did her work when she would visit New Orleans. So um, in today's world, we talk about immigrants and immigration so much in our news, and she is actually the patron saint of immigrants. So join us as we explore her life on this episode of Roots of Faith. I am here today with Sister Renee Kittleson, and you are a member of Mother Cabrini's Order, the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Yes. Say, That's a long one. I've got it mm -hmm. all correct. And we're actually here in the chapel where St. Mother Cabrini has actually prayed. I, th I don't think people realize um, how much you hear of Cabrini High School, which is, you know, the facility, but I don't think they realize that she actually came here that she slept here, that she worshiped in this, this beautiful chapel that's right behind us. So you work with, with prison, listen to me, her background is with prison ministry, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you're here as a campus minister working with campus ministry for Cabrini High School, correct? Yes, correct, All right. yes. So tell us a little bit about um, Mother Cabrini. You want, where do you want to start, her life? Yes, I'll let you pick. St. Francis Cabrini, she was born in northern Italy in Sant'Angelo in the Lodi area of Italy. And um, she was born in 1850, the last of 11 children. A lot. I knew that. <laughs> and when she, when she was um, born, um, kind of this mysterious thing happened. All these doves came right around the family home. Oh, wow. And the father was so astonished to see that. It was kind of like a symbol that this, is, this child is going special. to be very, very special. So she was born uh, two months premature. And for some reason, that just really had a negative impact on her health. She was never really strong. And um, her uh, father used to read stories to them about the missionaries and then he, a priest came to visit her parish and talk all about his activities in China. Well, little Francesca, she <laughs> was enthralled with the idea of being a missionary and going to China. So um, her uncle lived by a river, and she used to make little paper boats, put violets in them, and pretend like that those were her missionaries. Off. She was yep, sending she was them sending off them to off. China. Well, one day she fell into the river. She couldn't, she couldn't swim, swim, and nobody was around to oh, help goodness. her. Mm -hmm. And so she claims her guardian angel came to her rescue. Well, it must have been the case because nobody else rescued Got her. her. But that put a bit of a fear of the water into Cabrini. Um, but later in her life, when she did become a missionary, she had to cross the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean. Ocean 24 times. Wow. And they weren't wow. modern cruise liners. Back then, that's um, right. And other people would get seasick, but not Francesca. She would just sit. She conquered her fear. She had this motto, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. So that gave her the courage. And uh, she'd uh, just sit uh, and write letters to all the sisters um, that she in the convents around the world. But that's jumping ahead. I was about to say. Uh, we're yes. jumping way ahead. So let us go back to young Francesca. Well, when she was um, uh, 18, she be got, be obtained a teacher's certificate. And uh, with that, she thought, well, now I'm going to enter a religious order. But she had applied at two, with two different orders, and neither one of them mm, would accept her. her. That's right because she w she just did not have um, really good stamina, good health. Or so they thought. <laughs> so, th so they thought is right. Well, 
One day, her, the local bishop said to her, you know, Francesca, you want to be a missionary. Um, but there, there really, at that time, was no such thing. There weren't missionary women in the Catholic Church. Right. And so he said, why don't you start your own order? And he gave her an old Franciscan um, uh, monastery. And with some orphans she had been working with, um, she started our order. Uh, and eventually it was come to known as the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the first missionary order in the whole Catholic oh, wow. Church of women. So after the order was together for a while and she had a hundred uh, sisters, she thought, well, now, now is the time. time to go. I'm going <laughs> to go to the great Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He really was an awesome man. But she went to him and said, okay, we're ready to go to China. Well, what do you think he said? We know, famous no. words. <laughs> he said, no, not to the east, but to the west, mm -hmm. because there were so many Italians immigrating to the Americas. They were not well received. They weren't receiving the spiritual help they needed, or, um, and their, well, their situation was pretty desperate. Right. I mean, here they were coming in, in, in mass mm -hmm. with no place to go. Right. So regardless of the city where they arrived, New Orleans, New York, in yeah. particular, port cities, I mean, they were living in almost slum-like conditions. Absolutely. There was no place for them to live. Um, dysentery, diseases that are common among um being so close together, yes, and right. then not to mention yellow fever here. Yes, because if you're not eating right, and you're not you know keeping keeping as healthy as you can. Right. Your immune system is more susceptible to it. So yes, you know what would happen: the mom and the dad would die, and then the what? And often die the children too. Yes. So. Well, um, she um, she obeyed the uh, pope, and she went to New York. And uh, in New York, it seems so incredible to me that in three months she started a school and an orphanage in New York City. An amazing and amount of time. An amazing amount of time. So with that she was tra she was going back and forth between Europe and the Americas. She kind of hit all the major cities in the, the U.S. Chicago and Seattle and L.A. and but what happened at one stage was she was opening schools and orphanages, but she was also being asked to open hospitals. And um, we have a painting here of what happened when she refused to uh, open hospitals. She just didn't feel it was appropriate. Well, she called it a dream, but we think she had a lot of visions and apparitions, but mm -hmm. she said in a dream in her humility that she was in a hospital room and the only other person in the room was the Blessed Mother. And um, the Blessed Mother was looking after patients. And uh, Cabrini said, well, what are you doing? And the Blessed Mother said, well, I'm doing what you refused to do. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness, with that. That changed her mind. That changed her mind very rapidly. So um, she did, she opened a hospital in New York and um, Two in Chicago. Chicago. Sister Renee, we were just talking about, you know, her coming to New York and the work she did in New York, but it wasn't long after that. She was right here in New Orleans, yes. right? Tell us a little bit about yes. her work here in New Orleans and what she found when she got here. Yes, well, she hadn't heard very good things about New Orleans when it came to the Italian immigrants because um, eight, um, eight Italian gentlemen were accused of certain crimes, and, but they were exonerated. However, after, they, after that happened, they were lynched, yeah. and she was not very happy about that at all. So she came down here, and, uh, but what she found down here was there's so many orphany, orphans, um, especially with the yellow fever yeah. being so rampant. So um, she opened an orphanage on uh, St. Philip Street, and... Um, and that property is still there. That property yeah. is still there, yes. It was an orphanage for quite a number of years, and then it became a day school. Mm -hmm. But why it was uh, an orphanage, um, she, um, in, she had an incredible way of um, befriending people who could help out with her mis missions. Good philanthropist, yeah. yes. <laughs> very good. And she had befriended a certain um, um, cap sea captain by the name of Pizzati, 
And uh, she invited him to see her orphanage. But when he did, he saw like three children in a bed and it was just overcrowded. Mm -hmm. So he said, um, well, Cabrini, you find the property and I'll provide the money. Well, uh, she found this beautiful property right here in, by St. John's Bayou. But, um, and he said, well, I'll give you so much money to build the orphanage. And she said, oh, no, that won't be enough. <laughs> and uh, so he gave her $75,000 to, to build this Esplanade building. Yeah, that's, this is the turn of the century. This is like 1904. It was yes, built then. So you're not, talking about you know, the early 1900s. Exactly. And I mean, unreal that what that would be worth in today's, you know, today's yes. money. Yes. So um, the orphanage, <clears throat> the building was an orphanage for 54 years and even this chapel she actually prayed in this beautiful mm -hmm. chapel um <clears throat> which makes cabrini which makes holy ground exactly holy ground however in 19 in um, 1917 she was in chicago and she was preparing little christmas um, gifts for the children <clears throat> in the neighborhood and she died. She died very suddenly. Oh. She died at age 67, but she had started 67 schools, hospitals, and orphanages all around the world. The world, yeah. It was uh, quite remarkable. Um, but um, coming, coming back here to New Orleans, uh, as I say, the building was here, uh, 1959, we decided we really, uh, there was not a big need for an orphanage here, so we turned it into a high school. And, um, Which there was a need for. <laughs> yes, there was a need for a high school, and Sister Aloysius was the, our awesome principal for many years. Uh, by the but by the time it came to 1965, we had uh, grown this building, and the new building on Moss Street was built, and um, so that was opened in 1965. And uh, our high school is a medium-sized high school, and I cannot go any place in New Orleans without finding people who. What came to Cabrini knew somebody who came to Cabrini. Their mama was they, from Cabrini. That's everybody, it. there's a Cabrini connection all over New Orleans. There really is. Mm -hmm. And but with that too, um, y'all have been able to do much here, such yes. as the museum that you were telling us about. You yes. know, that's in the school. Well, is it in the school or is it in part of the it's school? It's in the Esplanade building, which was the orphanage. So we have a beautiful museum that just opened, dedicated to St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, and <clears throat> also the room where she stayed when she came here. So we have that on display. But she is the um, first American citizen to be canonized as saint. She became a naturalized citizen in my hometown of Seattle <laughs> in 1909. And um, she, the, the rule for the order was approved so quickly. And um, everything about Cabrini was fascinated me. And that's why I entered the Missionary Sister of the Sacred Heart, because she was such a, she was such a wonderful missionary. She took her example from St. Francis Xavier. So her first name was Francis, last name Cabrini, but she took um, the name of Xavier when she became a religious. Because of her love for the missionary life, Yes, right? the missionary, because he was such a great missionary, mm -hmm. right. Sister Renee, before we went on break, you were just saying what led you to become the missionary sister of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, right? Y'all have a lot to say in one mouthful. But you were telling me before this show, your life, and so we have to incorporate this into it because you are the living example of what she envisioned, and that's what needs to be told. So you were just saying that's what made you want to become. So let's recap that. All right. Well, when I was a senior in high school, my mom read the nun story, and she said, oh, Renee, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. So I read it, and then the movie came out, and I, oh, look at those sisters praying. And I thought, that's going to be my secret desire, but I'll never do anything about that. And then I was going to uh, CCD, catechism classes, and the priest said, Renee, have you ever thought of being a nun? And I said, oh, no, because it was going to be my secret desire, and I was going to get married and have lots of kids. <laughs> well, that blew the whole thing. 
So I started looking for religious orders, and once I went to church, I saw this book with all the religious orders. And as I went through it, I didn't know much about uh, sisters, but I knew I didn't want to be stuck in an order that only nursed, only taught. Well, this, um, this magazine had uh, said, you could be a missionary sister of the Sacred Heart, you could be um, almost anything you wanted to be. And still be you in could the be audience, a nurse, right. a teacher, a missionary, a secretary, anything. So, oh, that's for me. So I contacted the sisters and within six months I entered the order and went back to New York to, um, for my formation. And then they knew that I had a little leaning into wanting to be a nurse, so they sent me to Chicago to a big, fabulous hospital, uh, Columbus. I did my nurse's training, but guess what happened next? They wanted to send me to Australia. <laughs> well, I really didn't. So when your idea to go to Australia. Uh, that wasn't my idea. <laughs> I thought I never, maybe it was your idea. I never wanted to go to Australia, but once I went there, I never wanted to come back. I was there for 16 years, fabulous years. I eventually became the director of nursing. I was the director of nursing for 11 years at Cabrini Hospital in Melbourne. I got involved in prison ministry. I um, befriended two of the most notorious criminals in, in all of Australia, and we just became really good friends. It was a life-changing experience for them and for me. And uh, my friend Johnny, who uh, was the first inmate who ever wrote to me, he introduced me to other inmates. And I had no idea that I could really relate to, to inmates them. so well. And um, Opening up a new chapter Opening now. <laughs> up a whole new chapter. And actually, Mother Cabrini was very involved with inmates at Cook County Jail uh, in, Chicago. in Chicago. Yes, she and the sisters used to visit them. So um, anyway, they, I've, I discovered they were going to send me back to Chicago. I thought, oh, I don't want to go to Chicago again. I'm just, everything's wonderful here in Australia. But they sent me back. And uh, I, I opened up the scriptures. I did some scripture roulette and turned to Jeremiah, and it said, <laughs> pray for the city to which you are exiled, for your welfare depends on the welfare of that city. Oh, goodness. So oh, anyway, awesome. the only thing that attracted me to Chicago was they had the largest jail in the world, <laughs> in the U.S. Only person that so would want to go to a city because of the yeah. big jail they've got. <laughs> So uh, in 1980, I, was, I went back to um, Chicago and I worked on degrees because I really had this dream to be a prison chaplain. I volunteered at Cook County Jail in the Gateway Drug Program as a volunteer chaplain for six years. I befriended men, men on death row, some of whom were innocent. Uh, eventually, they got the death penalty overturned. But um, I'm sure I'm the only person who ever cried when they left Cook County Jail. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience. And I, got in, I involved one of our sisters, a sister Josephine Migliore. She had been our ass assistant mother general. And I got her involved in prison ministry. And I said, oh, Josephine, you're like a duck to water. The first time she went to jail, she was just. First time she went to jail, she was expression. So, <laughs> she was so good with the men. And, um, so anyway, I still had this burning desire to be a prison chaplain. Well, I graduated from Loyola, Chicago with a master's in pastoral studies, and I, here I am, world, I'm going to be a chaplain. And I discovered I, they wouldn't hire me because I wasn't ordained. So <laughs> then chaplain. I was sent to Seattle. And, um, Which is your hometown, correct? My hometown. And um, I became a Catholic contract chaplain, working part-time in the prisons. And I was still waiting for this wonderful job to open. Well, <laughs> eventually, the fabulous Lutheran minister who was a chaplain where I was working, he died. And so I applied to get the job as a uh, chaplain for the Monroe Correctional Complex with the most mentally ill men in the whole state. And um, <clears throat> they wouldn't uh, allow me to, uh, to apply because I wasn't ordained. And I said, well, I think that's a discrimination. And so with that, they said, yes, 
will give you a <laughs> waiver if you can prove that you're as qualified as any Protestant minister. And so I did, and uh, Archbishop Hunthausen sent several letters of support for me. And by that time, I had already been the acting chaplain for one year, and I became one of the first women in all of the USA to be a prison chaplain of the Department of Corrections. And it was my favorite job ever. I just loved it. We had a wonderful, the Department of Corrections in Washington State is awesome anyway. I had a wonderful time. And um, then I had started with 140 inmates, but by the time I got up to 800 inmates, it was oh, just getting, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't with the job I applied for. So you were saying 800 was a little bit much for you, yes, right? Yes, yes. So then what happened? <laughs> well, then uh, we opened um, a low-income housing facility with, uh, in collaboration with HUD Housing mm -hmm. in downtown Seattle. And so I went to work there and became the manager. And for six years, I worked with seniors, which was a, a w wonderful experience. And, and totally different from totally these others, different. from nursing or from yes. prison ministry, yes. so another chapter. So, um, but then uh, I was sent to Golden, Colorado, to uh, Mother Cabrini's shrine, which is, we have three shrines to Mother Cabrini. Okay, and good. the one in, in Golden is the, our most popular one, right off I-70, it's wonderful. So I was there for 14 months. Then I was sent back to Chicago again, to um, our national shrine to Mother Cabrini, and I worked there for a couple years. And now, not to interrupt you, but you were saying there were three. So oh, I'm sorry. One, one yes, is in yes. Golden. You said it, one is in Chicago. Chicago. I'm assuming the other and is the, New York. The other one is in New York. And so that people Manhattan. know. So if you're in those cities, folks, yes, um, look for the Mother Cabrini shrines. shrines because I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt wonderful. your story. I just when yeah. you said that, I wanted to make sure we let them know where her shrines were. Yes. So you then went from Golden to Chicago. Yes, Chicago for two years. Where I worked at our beautiful national shrine. It's the most beautiful one we the have. The Chicago one. Yes, it is. And that's where she died. That's where she died, exactly. Um, and then, um, a little over a year ago, I came here to New Orleans, where I'm um, settling into Cabrini High School. And another chapter, because now another, you're with students, yes. with student yes, ministry. Students, so, yes. you know, you've really been this missionary all over the world, right? just like her in many ways. Um, real quickly, because we are we are getting close to time, but the miracles that were attributed to her. Yes, um, the first one happened four years after her death in our hospital in New York. Baby Peter Smith was born. The nurses put the wrong dose of silver nitrate in his eyes to cleanse him, and it blinded him. Some went down his throat and caused oh, pneumonia. Goodness. So the sisters panicked and prayed all night, put relics of Cabrini on his eyes, and uh, his vision was restored the next day, and within uh, 48 hours, his pneumonia was gone. Um, he grew up to be a priest, and so did his brother. Wow. Now, the other miracle occurred in Seattle, where one of our sisters, Sister Delfina, was um, dying, and Mother Cabrini appeared in a vision to her and said, uh, well, I've got work for you to do. And it happened three nights in a row. And then she got up, was fine, went back to work at Cabrini Hospital for about 46 more years. Wow, 46 years. And then the, um, those were the, for beatification. Now, the miracles for canonization both occurred in Italy, in almost the same part of Italy that she was, she was from. from. Wow. And uh, the first man <clears throat> was sent home from the hospital to die with three serious conditions, prayed to Cabrini, totally restored to health. The other gentleman had a very bad bone infection in his foot, and the doctors couldn't do anything for him. He prayed to Cabrini and was instantaneously healed. So the two of them were both verified as miracles, and they both showed up for her canonization. And when was, when was her canonization? 1946. Okay. 
Sister Renee, in closing, I mean, she, this is a dynamic story about her, but there's a couple of things that we have to let people know. Her, tell us a little bit, her feast day was... Her, her feast day was December 22nd and still is throughout the rest of the world. However, in the U.S., our sisters requested that they change the date to November the 13th uh, because December 22nd is too close to Christmas. And here in New Orleans, though, she's been honored, isn't it like St. Caprini Day? They declared like a, a day yes, that's December hers, 22nd. December 22nd. Yes, they did. Here in New Orleans is yes. St. Cabrini Day. Right, And right. you have a plaque for that, I believe, in the yes, room where she is. Yes, yes. Um, a proclamation from the city. That's it. Yes. So, um, so folks, come and visit the, the I guess, shrine, her room, mm -hmm. um, this beautiful chapel. And Sister Renee, I can't thank you enough for being my guest today to hear oh. your story and your life as a sister living the, the life that she envisioned of y'all and the life she envisioned for herself. So join us again, folks, for another episode of Roots of Faith.